Welcome everyone to this panel on civic learning as part of the Reagan Institute Summit on Education, or RISE. I want to thank David Trulio, Roger Zakheim, Janet Tran, Meredith Stassa, and Kimberly Lapina for inviting more perfect and our distinguished guests to participate in this important summit and to highlight such a critical subject to the functioning and renewal of our democracy. More Perfect is an initiative of all 14 presidential centers, including President Reagan's Foundation and Institute, the National Archives Foundation, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, Corporation for Public Broadcasting, Karsh Institute of Democracy at the University of Virginia, and more than 100 partners working together to advance five democracy goals, the first of which is universal civic learning. It's hard to imagine a vibrant democracy without Americans first understanding their history and our democratic norms, values, and institutions. Fortunately today, we are joined by three of my favorite people, top leaders and experts to focus on the opportunities, challenges, and ways forward on civic learning, and I hope a culture that fosters a greater sense of we. I also want to thank the uh, Ronald Reagan Presidential Library for hosting us last fall for an engaging summit on civic learning. Louise DeBay is the executive director of iCivics, an organization founded by Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who was appointed, of course, to the U.S. Supreme Court by President Reagan. Louise is a graduate of McGill University and has an MBA from Yale University. Yuval Le Levin is Director of Social, Cultural, and Constitutional Studies at the American Enterprise Institute, founder and editor of National Affairs, editor or contributor to other publications, and former member of the Domestic Policy Council at the White House for President George W. Bush. Eric Liu is founder of Citizen University, former presidential speechwriter and deputy domestic policy advisor to President Bill Clinton and contributor to The Atlantic and CNN. All three are co-chairs of Democracy Goal One of More Perfect. Louise, let's start with you. In the past two weeks, the country got some pretty gloomy news from its civic education and history report card. Uh, this, of course, is on the heels of rises uh, in the aftermath of the A Nation of Risk report in 1983 sort of awakened the country to its educational challenges. Tell us about that report card and why should Americans care? Yes, well, th first of all, thank you so much uh, to our friends at the uh, Reagan Library. It's uh, wonderful uh, to be with you again and particularly around this topic. So yes, I think a lot of people uh, in your audience will have seen the report, NAEP uh, civic scores as well as the NAEP uh, history scores. So for NAEP, at eighth grade, we have the first decline that's statistically significant, and it's really not good. So our results are that 22% of eighth grade students are not proficient, or are proficient, sorry, only. Um, and that that is shows that we are back to the levels uh, of proficiency from about 1998. So that's a sad day for us, but it's even worse for history. In history, we're talking about 13% proficient rate, rates. Um, and I think uh, that's a real wake up call to our country. And when you look at these results compared to other results, uh, you recognize that there is a huge gap in the amount of investment that our country is making to teach about history and civics. So we spend about $50 per student per year on STEM education, but we send, spend about 50 cents on civics. And that's a real gap. And it's no wonder that we are seeing the results that we are. Having said that, uh, there are significant glimmers of hope in this civics data. If you dig a little bit deeper, and these are of course only correlations and we'll have to do more data analysis. But if you do, you find that once uh, teachers, particularly when you have well-trained teachers, they uh, lead to better results. So that's really interesting. Uh, when you uh, dig a little deeper yet, you'll find that students who have civics classes, who spend a lot of time with the Constitution, uh, who talk uh, at home about the political subjects, 
And all of those factors lead to significantly better results. So it's not like the way forward isn't clear. Uh, we have a way forward. It's just that our current situation is not good. Thank you, Louise. I, I was encouraged by that little glimmer of hope that you reference in the report card that those students who perform better in civics and history actually felt like they had a um, uh, were empowered to have an, a greater impact on their communities and, and country. You've all that leads me. I, I, one of my favorite books is A Time to Build, that wonderful book that you wrote number of years ago, talking about the uh, formative role that our institutions play in shaping our character, our civic behavior. Can you talk about the role of institutions in, in cultivating good citizens? And how do we recover from what you call the failure of our understanding of institutions today? Yeah, thank you very much, Bridge. I appreciate that. And, and thanks to our friends at the Reagan Foundation for having this conversation and for putting such uh, attention on this important set of issues. I'm very glad, Bridge, that you use the term cultivate in your question, because I think that's an important part of thinking about what civic learning and civic education really has to be. Um, it, it, it ultimately is a matter of formation. Our, our kind of government requires a particular sort of citizen, a person capable of handling an enormous amount of freedom responsibly, of making judgments, of showing restraint, of tolerating people who are different. None of those things is easy to do. Um, that kind of citizen is not a natural artifact that just drops from the sky. That kind of citizen is a social achievement, and it is... Uh, a sort of person that has to be formed so that um, although politics certainly has a place in forming that kind of person, ultimately it's not enough. That person has to be formed by the, the broader set of institutions of our society, as you say, by family, by community, maybe by religion, by education, by work. Our politics can't function if those other institutions are not doing that critical formative work um, and our politics can't produce that citizen on its own. And so civic education is not just about conveying information. It's not just, though it is in part, an important part, about teaching history, about teaching about the institutions. It's also about a kind of formative work that those other institutions do by engaging in the activities of citizenship. It's interesting to me and encouraging that Louise mentions that uh, one of the things you find in those NAEP scores is that students who are otherwise encouraged to be engaged and involved um, do better in civics and do better as citizens. That is, people who, who, who live their lives beyond school in a way that takes citizenship seriously, have conversations with family and with people they trust about politics uh, and about history, that kind of, uh, of, of all-encompassing engagement in the process of formation has to be part of what our other institutions do. They have to not only, again, convey data and knowledge and dates and information, they have to model a kind of behavior, a sort of character that's required of being a citizen, a set of virtues. And maybe one of those virtues that I'd mention in particular that's especially important for forming American citizens is the virtue of responsibility. Responsibility is a very American idea. The, the Oxford English Dictionary, when it looks for the earliest uses of it, several of the earliest that it finds are actually in the writings of the American founders. Uh, and there's a reason for that. It's because a society like ours particularly requires that concept. Responsibility implies both ownership and accountability. It's a way of speaking in the first person plural, of saying ours and our and we and us and not them and their when talking about politics. And I think that that is a skill you don't just learn by reading it in a book or hearing it from a teacher. That's a skill you learn by watching people you respect engage in it. And in that sense, our, our other institutions, other than schooling itself, have to be involved in civic education and formation. We all have to always be engaged in the process of showing a rising generation of citizens what citizenship looks like because it's complicated and it does require a lot from us. And so I think we always have to see ourselves as being engaged in the work of modeling good citizenship and civic education is a part of that. Uh, it, 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 it has to see as part of its purpose, a kind of modeling for students of what citizenship looks like beyond the classroom, beyond the school, 
uh, out there in the real world. And I, again, I, I think all of us, as part of our responsibility as citizens, have to take that uh, as our role and not just their role, not just teachers, not just other people, but every one of us, you and I, have a role to play uh, in helping uh, the next generation of Americans be better citizens. Concept of responsibility. I know the founders worried a lot in founding a country so strongly predicated on rights that future generations distant from the revolution, <laughs> the sacrifice it took to secure those rights uh, would need to be reminded again and again. And actually Washington and Adams envisioned a national university that would put the education of citizens at the center of the inquiry. Um, Eric, you know, you've just been so extraordinary, both in your White House service and, and after it, and building Citizen University. Uh, I've watched your TED Talks numerous times, been inspired by them. You've spoken and written so widely on the topic of, of civic learning and engagement, including that wonderful book. If, if folks haven't read it, uh, you really should, The Gardens of Democracy. And given the, the threats to our democracy in recent years, and given that every state constitution actually puts civic learning at the center of the educational inquiry, but doesn't seem to be much of a priority, why do you think that is? And, and what can we do to get the country's focus on civic learning and engagement again? Well, Bridge, um, uh, thanks for having us here. I just, it's delightful to be part of this whole Reagan Institute summit and uh, in this room with uh, some great folks. And I am, um, you know, I, I really want to pick up actually where you've all left off. Um, and he, he noted that you, he loved your use of the word cultivate. Um, and I would add that I love, uh, you've all, your use of the word formation. Um, and, and when you put cultivation and formation together, you're talking culture. Um, and I think a huge part of what we've got to attend to right now um, is the ways in which the formation of young people as citizens capable of self-government, able to balance rights and responsibilities, able to see them actually not even as things to balance against each other, but to see them as entwined, that rights are responsibilities properly understood. Um, and, and so there's no duality there. It's actually a unitary concept if you take it seriously, that that is not just a matter for education institutions, whether it's K-12 or higher ed. This is a culture question. What are the values, the norms, the habits, the narratives, the mindsets, and the heart sets that we propagate every day in our lives together uh, that form uh, each other as citizens. Th there is constantly a civic curriculum going on around us. It's often an ugly, patchy, you know, negative curriculum on how not to be and what not to do uh, to be a pro-social contributor to community, but it's happening all the time. And people young and old are learning all the time, both by our, from our leaders and from each other. Uh, and from the social norms that we create. And so I think an emphasis in the first place on culture really matters. Uh, this is uh, a whole of society effort. And so when you think about state constitutions, yes, you know, state constitutions, uh, all of them have variations on providing amply for public education. And all of them have um, behind that kind of the theory that the whole point, uh, as Justice O'Connor uh, stated when she created iCivics, the whole point of free compulsory public education was not to make employees and workers, it was to make citizens, it was to make people capable uh, uh, of governing ourselves. And so I think, uh, number one, focusing on culture and the ways in which everybody, wherever you sit, in an education institution, great, but in a business, in a faith organization, uh, in an NGO, um, in a neighborhood, in your family, wherever you sit, you have the power to catalyze a different kind of set of norms of being, right? Uh, and that, that's number one. I think the second thing, though, uh, to your question, Bridge, um, when it comes to institutions of higher learning and, and to the K-12 system uh, itself, um, you know, these last few years of political upheaval and turmoil and conflict, uh, um, as you say, uh, of different kind of threats and, and kind of ero erosion or corrosion of democratic norms, um, have a silver lining. Uh, they are making a lot of people who had not been paying attention to the health of our democracy pay attention to the health of our democracy. Um, and that is leading a lot of people to ask questions about, well, what are our institutions doing to shape uh, people as citizens? And, you know, on the one hand, that's great. On the other hand, I think what we have to recognize, and we're seeing it unfold in states across the country, is that 
all that does is replicate one more cycle, one more level, the same kinds of division and polarization that we see in our everyday politics. And so what I'm worried about is not so much how do we get more people to care. People are caring right now, they're, but they're caring in very polarized ways. People on the, you know, on the right caring that you know, our curriculum should do this and do that, and on the left caring that it should do a different thing. Um, and I think what we together have to cultivate are ways in which there are cross ideological, cross uh, partisan partnerships, relationships, practices, uh, ways of learning together um, that actually emphasize that the way that we move these things in our institutions, wh whether it's state legislatures and state um, uh, budgets for civic learning um, or federal policy, um, that we've got to do this in ways that actually recognize that literally no party has a monopoly on truth and no party has a monopoly on um, error either. And so we've got to be able to learn from each other in a way that is about fusing and synthesizing things that people have to bring. And that is, I think, what most people actually would want. Um, but we are subject in our political culture today to the, you know, to the outsized effect of what Amanda Ripley calls conflict entrepreneurs, uh, people who, who, you know, and they are sometimes elected officials and sometimes they are just cultural entrepreneurs, but they are uh, people who find a great opportunity in creating uh, more polarized, more extreme uh, versions of fights. Uh, and that makes it harder actually for us to, in fact, um, grapple with each other and grapple with what we have in common here. Uh, so I think, you know, the, the number one culture uh, and how each of us, wherever we sit, um, are making a culture contagious by our choices and norms and, and example. And number two, thinking about how we create more spaces where people can deal with each other across ideological and party lines, like this summit, um, to actually learn about how we learn about uh, how others see the world and see these questions that go back to our, our founding. Stated, Eric, the power of culture of heart sets. I hadn't heard that term, but I love it. Um, it reminds me that there was this wonderful little book uh, published uh, around the bicentennial, We Hold These Truths. And in it, it starts by saying the, the highest office in the land, and we need to remind Americans of this, is not president, not governor, not senator, not any public office, but citizen. And uh, the best uh, quick capturing of what you and you've all talked about in terms of responsibility was freedom and responsibility, liberty and duty. That's the deal. Almost like a unitary, a, a, a united principle. Um, so the three of you have have been working together uh, with other leaders across the country on um, advancing what we've been calling these five democracy goals. We we thought the power of bringing uh, uh, leaders and institutions behind uh, moving clear goals, targets, plans to meet them, so that we had more to showcase as a country as we move toward the 250th anniversary of the birth of the nation in 2026. Uh, and of course, democracy goal one appropriately begins with uh, universal civic learning. So Louise, can you talk about those goals and plans? And I know we've heard the gloomy side of the, of the <laughs> civic report card. Could you share any progress that we're actually seeing across the country in advancing civic learning? Yeah, um, I'll start by picking up where Eric left off a little bit. Um, I think when we talk about culture and shifts in mindset and, and those things sound really big, right? And they are. But I think for the first time, uh, we have gotten uh, together under the auspices of More Perfect, a real plan with actionable goal that will make a real difference to our country. So I'm gonna talk about that, but I wanna just pick up on something that Eric said first, which is that More Perfect and iCivics also conducted polling, which really lends credence to what Eric was saying, which is that most of the Americans around us everywhere really believe in the strength and the potential of civic learning. So if what we are trying to do was to change the culture to something that people don't want, that wouldn't work. That is not the case. As Eric said, there are conflict entrepreneurs that are trying to exploit what the majority actually want, not only a small majority, a incredibly large majority. Almost 80% of Americans support more funding for civic learning, let alone civic learning itself. That holds true 
within primary voters as well. So it's important to say that we're building on what Americans actually want. Americans want their student, their children to learn the truth uh, about our country, the full history. They want, they want it all. Um, and I think we need to feel emboldened as education leaders uh, to continue on that path and to make that happen. So with that, we built a plan. That plan is comprehensive uh, and it is measurable. So it includes 10 million students, uh, students who are not necessarily on college campuses getting, uh, being trained um, as, uh, for civic life. It includes adults working to learn about how to be information literate through libraries in our country. Uh, it includes strengthening policies. Policies are the way in which our country invests in history and civic learning. And that requires that we put together policies at the state level primarily, but also funding uh, at the federal level to sustain that work. It includes training. Uh, educators to deliver quality um, uh, instruction to, to our students. So all of those uh, uh, come together to have a, a, a strong and comprehensive plan um, that we can report on. I will just add that on the positive side again, since I'm here to, uh, to uh, lift spirits, um, we have seen a lot of progress at the state level. People report on very negative news, uh, we are monitoring 71 bills that um, ensure progress around against uh, this plan uh, in 27 states. That's red, blue, and purple, all colors. And those include uh, high school requirements in Alaska, one of the last states that didn't have a high school requirements for civics. It includes a, a fantastic bill in New Hampshire for middle school civics. Uh, that's sitting on Governor Sununu's desk right now. It includes information literacy in Missouri. It includes high school requirements in Minnesota. So we have made tremendous amounts of progress, actually, uh, in seven states now over since 2021. We have now passed requirements. This is not the end all and be all, right? Uh, requirements are insufficient. We need classroom time. We need funding. We need educators that are trained but it is a strong beginning and we are seeing the progress accelerate. So uh, we're actually very hopeful uh, for the future. He's no better advocate and your 38 state teams and all the work you're doing all across the country. It's so inspiring. You know, you've all given the strong support from parents, from teachers, from the students themselves, you know, our polling or out that uh, the appetite for understanding our history and, and engaging in uh, civic learning, not just in a particular course, but across the curriculum is so high. I remember when I was in the White House, we convened in a, uh, a gathering on, on uh, Capitol Hill after 9-11, and we brought David McCullough up to give a little talk. We expected a few people to come. We had the Speaker of the House, the Minority Leader, the Majority Leader of the Senate, the Minority Leader, three justices of the U.S. Supreme Court. I mean, it was just extraordinary. And Senators uh, Lamar Alexander and Robert Byrd made common cause uh, to pass legislation to provide lots of support for civic education in the country on the Carnegie Corporation of New York's report, The Civic Mission of Schools. So given all this wellspring of support, what do you see are the concrete barriers that are inhibiting our progress in putting civic learning at the center of education again, and, and how do we best overcome them? Well, you know, I think in a sense, the chief barrier is suspicion. Um, and that's, that's a kind of meta fact about civic education, because it's actually what we're trying to overcome by the work of civic education. And it's also what stands in the way um, of advancing the kind of work that uh, Louise is talking about. There's a lot of suspicions around the motives of civic education programs. There are some people on the left who think that the purpose is to whitewash American history and to sustain various kinds of oppressive orthodoxies or practices. There are people on the right who think the purpose is to malign American history, to deny the achievements or the ideals of our country. 
Um, this is an era of suspicion in American life, and civic education has very much been a victim of that suspicion. But I think that one insight that we've got to draw from the from the broad condition of our society is that you cannot overcome that suspicion by dismissing it. You have to overcome it by proving it wrong. And that means that we do have to begin by taking it seriously and saying, look, it's understandable that people now on, on one side or another of our politics would wonder whether this idea that's being advanced um, is really going to be in the interest of their children or whether it's advancing some cause they don't support. Sure, that's a serious question, but here is the answer. And the answer is that this is ultimately a way to rebuild the confidence of the rising generation in the nation that it is inheriting. And that is good for the left, it is good for the right. It does not involve dismissing our country's faults and it does not involve dismissing its virtues. It involves coming to know it in a full and mature way. And I think that argument and the very idea of what it would mean to have a mature relation to our own inheritance as a society is what has to be built out by the work of civic education and by the work of championing it in state legislatures and in the public debate. So I think we have to see ourselves as combating suspicion. And that is really a lot of what is now involved in healing our society more generally and in rebuilding a civic culture that is capable not only of civic education, but of the basic work of our politics. Everybody has to deal with suspicion. Every politician with an idea for improving the country finds themselves suspected uh, in one way or another of bad motives. And it is important not to uh, dismiss the motives of those who suspect you, but to prove them wrong and to show what it is you're trying to achieve and why and how. And, you know, I think that kind of obstacle is what we have to think about. Ultimately, we have to find ways to make it good for us, to force us to show the larger society why more civic learning and better civic learning is in its interest. That'll improve the final product, but it is an obstacle and it's hard work to uh, overcome that kind of suspicion as anybody who's tried to achieve anything in American politics uh, in the 21st century could tell you. Uh, rebuilding the confidence of the rising generation in the, in the nation that they will inherit so beautifully and powerfully said you've all. So Eric, you know, whenever we hear about civic education and learning, we tend to think of K-12 education, middle school, high school. Uh, but former college president Derek Brock, uh, Bach uh, wrote a pr provocative piece in the Chronicle of Higher Education about the crisis of civic education in our colleges and universities, which of course are places where uh, students ought to be engaged in the civic inquiry. You know, you started Citizen University, um, so I wanted to ask you, what do you think can be done in higher education to ensure this rising generation um, uh, understands the, uh, the core uh, values, norms, institutions uh, that they will inherit and need to renew for the next generation? Well, I think um, a couple things. I mean, in the first place, um, one of the things that is most important to recognize when you think about what you've always describing about suspicion uh, that pervades out there. Um, suspicion is the flips, I mean, is the, is the corollary to mistrust. Suspicion is evidence of the evaporation of trust, right? And so we don't trust each other. We don't trust politicians. We don't trust the other side. We don't trust institutions, one kind or another. Um, and I think that the way actually, you know, the, the word that you've all you used was mature, a mature way to understand the breadth of our, both our history, but also just the, the inherent tensions uh, that are baked into being an American and living under our scheme of a constitutional uh, republic. And I think the, the thing that we've got to recognize is that what maturity means in this context and what higher ed institutions are super well placed actually to, to cultivate um, is a literally a grown up approach to recognizing that there is more than one way to see a thing. And that the point isn't necessarily to overcome your suspicion by showing you that my way is the right way or that your way is the wrong way, but to recognize that these ways will coexist and sometimes conflict and sometimes overlap and sometimes ebb and flow. Uh, but to recognize that, you know, to me, the way we address the suspicion, uh, and again, college campuses are, a, are potentially a great place to do this, is to invite people 
into actually naming the full breadth of their differences of worldview. And college campuses today do not do that. They, they fail miserably at that. Um, college campuses today, um, particularly the more kind of, you know, large scale, powerful and elite institution you go to, um, they have cultures of ever greater self-censorship, ever greater, you know, careerism. I don't want to say anything that might come back and haunt me or hurt me. Um, and a greater kind of uh, uh, just so, not quite suppression, but a, a, a greater um, deflation uh, of the value of actual exchange, right? And this is true coming from both the left and the right. People on the right who just bang a drum about free speech, free speech, sometimes forget that free speech is more than simply sequential announcement of your views, and then you leave the room, right? Uh, and people on the left who are very uh, wary of free speech um, uh, similarly think that, well, if I'm simply presented with a view that is contrary to my own or, or that even questions my identity, then somehow I'm gonna evaporate, poof, and this will be completely destructive to me and my soul. And no, like what a mature understanding uh, of citizenship requires is to recognize that the point is not mere free speech, it's free exchange. It is the actual exchange of ideas and the interplay of different takes on things. We have to remember, the point here isn't to kind of win you over or to end an argument. America is an argument. We are meant perpetually to be contesting liberty and equality and the tensions between them a Jeffersonian view and a Hamiltonian view of the role of government, the pluribus and the unum parts of our national motto. There is no right answer to these. And God help us if we ever think there is a right answer that the state must enforce, right? The point is for us to actually be in perpetual tension. College campuses can and must be the arena where people in a mature way, in a historically literate way, in an emotionally intelligent way, can grapple with that complexity. And here's the thing. Students want this. When I go to campuses all around the United States, they would like more of this, but they're scared to be the ones to stick their necks out. And so this is on leaders. This is on presidents of, of higher, uh, inst higher institutions. It's on faculty members. It's on people learning to model for the students on their campuses what it looks like to live like a citizen this way. And I think this is, um, this is true, again, um, at the, regardless of the scale of institution. It goes back to formation. Um, most colleges and um, universities have stopped attending to this uh, because they focus on other issues. But whether your issue might be racial justice or environmental justice or tax policy or whatever it might be, in the United States, every issue reduces one way or another to a democracy issue. Is there enough participation to make the decisions we make on issue X or Y legitimate? And legitimacy, is a, as we're learning in these recent years, is a very fragile, evanescent thing. Um, and it go, I'm circling back to suspicion and trust. The way that we've got to change this on college campuses is to create more spaces and more places. You name the University of Virginia, they've got some great ones. We've got a project called the Better Arguments Project uh, that's working on college campuses around the country. Um, we have another formation program at Citizen University called Citizen Redefine that works with folks like North Carolina Campus Compact uh, to help uh, professionals and faculty members in higher ed institutions um, bring the students in their orbits along into this process of inquiry, formation, and grappling with difference and complexity. Uh, these are not habits um, that most colleges and universities are emphasizing, uh, and that is on uh, the leaders of those institutions right now. You're, I know you're head of Citizen University and its founder, but it uh, you inspire me. You should become a college president and <laughs> head of a network of, of higher education institutions across the country. So Louise, Yuval and, and uh, Eric have talked a lot about suspicion and differences and putting our differences on the table. I can't help but uh, ask you that, you know, Florida just rejected dozens of social studies te textbooks. They're, of course, not unique uh, in doing this. Um, so given the environment, how can we ensure students learn about their history, our shared history, and learn about how our democracy you know, functions and the role of our institutions and their role within them without igniting local firestorms that uh, prevent the teaching of, of our history and, and civic learning? Well, I'm gonna start a little ways back. Um, I, along with my colleagues, um, 
spent a lot of time in very different spaces. So very progressive spaces and very conservative spaces on purpose because, um, because I believe in the American experiment and I believe in um, talking uh, about difficult issues across differences um, and the plurality of points of view. And in those conversations, I have always come out uh, with a greater understanding of the complexity of the issue, as Eric points out. And I think that's really important uh, ground. So that um, is where education is right now, right? So civic education, but all of education is facing the same pressures that our society is facing because it's one of the last integrative institutions we have, even though it's not purely, it's not greatly integrated, it is uh, more than many others. And, and I think, um, K-12, particularly, that, that's what I know, um, is, is facing that pressure in a very direct way, and they are not prepared. Um, so I think our education leaders are being asked to do a task um, for society in some ways. And one of the things that doesn't help is to have one view um, alone without engaging your community in a conversation about it. So what, what we need to do as education leaders in districts is to go out and talk to parents, talk to them about what we should want for our students and how, because frankly, most of the parents, for the same reasons I talked about before, because we've been underinvested in history and civics for decades, we're facing uh, uh, the same issue uh, with our parents as we are with our students. So, so that's that's the first thing um, uh, that we need to do uh, together. So the way forward is not through facts, right? We've got Google now. We have to adapt, right? We're not in the same education uh, environment that we were many years ago. Uh, we have chat GPT. We've got a lot of different tools. What we need is to make meaning and to have these hard conversations, use primary sources, and, and do education in a very different way, in a way that students are empowered to be their own learners and to start that process, which will have them learn their entire lives. And that starts in the design of the classroom. So uh, we, along with uh, 300 uh, colleagues, um, did a project called Educating for American Democracy. That was funded by the NEH and the US Department of Education. Uh, those 300 people didn't believe the same thing. Very many different points of view, conservatives, all, everyone, um, political scientists, educators, all of those. And we came out with a roadmap. That roadmap is built around questions. Seven themes across US history and civics and questions. That it's really very important for us to lay out questions without trying to answer every single one of them one way. As Eric pointed out before, we need to have these uh, discussions and, and um, debates even among even our classroom because it's a complicated picture. History is not one thing. There are things to know, right? It's not as though I'm saying that everything is related. Yes, there are things to know, you need to know those dates, but it's no longer sufficient and we need to set up our classroom so we can deliver and that may not for now look the same uh, in any one state so um what i hope to encourage uh is is for um state leaders and other education leaders to know that this is the work we have to do now even though it's really difficult we have to build the courage to do it we also cannot impose a top-down idea of only one way. There has to be some, some uh, flexibility. Please, when I uh, asked former Librarian of Congress, Jim Billington, that question, he said, give, connect the young people to the original record of our history and let them have a vigorous debate in the context of the times and the relevance of those uh, original records uh, to, to circumstances today. So Eric, in your incredible book, The Gardens of Democracy, you talk about how 
self-interest is really, true self-interest is actually mutual interest. And I was really struck by that, given that Jefferson and Adams agreed that what they meant by the mystical notion of the pursuit of happiness wasn't just an individual right, but a cooperative enterprise that we help one another achieve. Uh, and you've all, you wrote in a subsequent piece, I think after your book, A Time to Build, about fortifying our democracy in an alienated age that required what you called almost a spiritual change. Um, and the standard of the first person plural we could serve as kind of a criterion for the way forward. So I'd love Eric and Yuval in that order for you to talk about as we move toward the 250th anniversary, just a few years from now, uh, what concretely do you hope will have been achieved to foster a greater sense of we, Eric? Well, I think, number one, I think if between now and uh, 2026, orders of magnitude more Americans are aware of what More Perfect uh, is doing and is all about and take ownership of the various goals that we've set here, um, I think that will be a great measure of success. Um, I think the second thing that flows from that, of course, um, is a bit of what Lu Louise was saying, that if more of us more often are willing to engage with people unlike us uh, in ways where we recognize that we're going to learn from each other uh, in this way, where we have habits and practices uh, of treating things not as winner take all, scorched earth, I must own the other side, kind of habits we've learned from social media, uh, but actually uh, learn to deal with each other in a way that again is rooted in relationship, but also rooted in place. I think that will be a great success. And one of the things that is super important for us to recognize, we've been talking about higher ed and K-12, and these are not just magical kind of abstract networks. They are networks of places and people um, that are grounded somewhere. Um, and when I think about, uh, actually just thinking about Justice O'Connor again and, uh, and iCivics, I've been telling the story a lot, not of Justice O'Connor, but actually of uh, Senate Majority Leader O'Connor because most people do not remember or know that prior to having been, long before actually having been nominated to the court, she was a, uh, um, she was a politician in Arizona. Uh, she was in the state Senate and she became majority leader. And in doing that, she cultivated, modeled and practiced a whole set of skills that it turns out would make her an incredible swing justice uh, on the court during her incredible formative time on the court. But I, I draw that line because you don't just one day think about a big national enterprise like More Perfect and think I want to plug into that. You don't just one day wake up and decide, I'm going to engage with the American Academy of Arts and Sciences on the commission that you all and I and others uh, were served on uh, called Our Common Purpose. You think about where you live. You think about the people you know and love or don't yet know and might fear. And the opportunity that we've got to do is to, in place, reconnect and rebuild muscle uh, for how to know each other deal with each other, learn how to solve problems together, deal, practice the habit of compromise, uh, draw lines where you have to, but recognize that done right, local democracy is a game of infinite repeat play. Uh, and so you've got to keep the game going, not to kind of wipe the other team off the map and end the game. And that was the Justice O'Connor way of being a politician, of being on the court. It's why I think President Reagan put her on the court. Uh, and I think that's a set of values and norms that are, um, if every one of us can kind of capture that essence and think about how can I bring that to bear where I live, um, then by 2026, we'll have made some real progress that maybe is not so measurable uh, by tangible uh, metrics, uh, but we'll feel it uh, in the spirit of the country. Well, Eric, and you've all in 30 seconds. <laughs> you know, in 30 seconds, maybe what I would say is that a lot of what we're getting at in this conversation is a concept of national unity that a better kind of civic education could help more Americans understand. And I would put it this way. I think in a, in a free society, unity does not mean thinking alike. Unity means acting together. And the, the question, how, given that we don't think alike, could we possibly act together, is the question to which civic education is an answer. But more than that, it's the question to which our system of government is an answer. I think the American Constitution is intended to be an answer to the question, how can we act together when we don't think alike? And that would come as a surprise, it seems to me, to a lot of Americans. And getting to know the system better, getting to know its history better, and more than that, getting to practice it.
to participate in it, to engage in it, teaches you that it is there to help us work together even when we don't think alike, especially when we don't think alike. And so it seems to me that seeing it that way can give us a kind of map for what it is that civic learning is for. Civic learning is for unity. Civic learning is for acting together even when we don't think alike. America knows how to do that. It is built around an idea of how to do that, and more Americans should recognize them. Wow. <laughs> I'd like to thank these three extraordinary people, Louise DeBay, Yvonne Levin, and Eric Liu, who literally spent their lives in service to their communities and nation over so many years and who continue to toil, as you've all just said, to create a greater sense of we. And I want to give special thanks to our dear friends at the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute and also the library in Simi Valley. Uh, for the extraordinary partnership um, over the past years and for allowing us to participate in their RISE Summit. So many thanks to all.